Now suppose I have acetic acid. Now I give soda. I can give potassium hydroxide as well. There's no problem. I'll give calcium oxide and heat. Now the product would be what? Product is simple. Acetic acid has two carbon. Now one of the carbon, the carbon in this carboxylic acid group will be removed off and whatever will be left that would give us the alkene. So CH4 is the final product apart from calcium carbonate. Fine. So very easy. Now suppose I have benzene as the final pro as the product of soda lime decarboxylation then what was the my reactant that you have to tell. You have to be quick and you must get this answer. In order to write the reactant you just have to increase one carbon because one carbon is removed in the form of CO2. So to get back to the reactant you just have to increase one carbon in the product. So you increase one carbon in the product in the outside the ring one carbon in the carboxylic group. Fine. So this is this is benzoic acid and you must know this. This is a very important common acid. If we carry out soda lime decarboxylation of benzoic acid we will get benzene. And we can solve more similar kind of problems. Fine. So soda lime decarboxylation is done now. Then we move on to the third reaction. Wood's reaction. In Wood's reaction what happens? Suppose I have Rx. Now this X can be chlorine, bromine or iodine. We don't take fluorine. The rate of reaction with fluorine is very less. And I add sodium to this. Then I get RR as we got in case of Colby's electrolysis and you can predict from just by the product that there must have been a dimerization from R dot and that's how we got RR. That is predictable. Right? Now the mechanism. Now here you have to be very alert and you have to be very inquisitive to learn the mechanism. If you don't have that quest, you will never learn the mechanism. Now I'll tell you, I'll guide you and you must try to infer what could be the mechanism. Now based upon the line of thinking I have asked you to think about before, whenever you look at a reaction, try to look at the strong reagents. Now those strong reagents are one which are unstable. Those unstable strong reagents initiate the reaction. Here we have only sodium, there is nothing else. There must be solvent I haven't mentioned. The solvent, okay, what can be the solvent here? In which reaction, suppose you have a statement, you have four statements in a question and one of the statement reads as, water is taken as a solvent in which reaction. Will that be a true statement? Can we take water or alcohol for that matter as a solvent in which reaction? Think about it, tell me. The answer would be, no, we can't take. We can't take because water is a polar protic solvent, alcohol is a polar protic solvent and sodium is a highly reactive metal. Now virtually there will be a fire in alcohol or water because of high solvation. Now in this solvation thing we have studied when I taught you solvent so I'm not getting into it but just to remind you that in polar protic solvent such as water because of high polarity the solvation process is very effective and a huge amount of solvation energy is released in a metal active metal like sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium and that huge amount of energy virtually starts to boil that water and catch the metal on, on fire. So these polar protic solvents are not taken as a solvent. Rather we take polar aprotic solvent like ether. Right? Ether is ROR oxygen is attached to carbon and not hydrogen so the polarity is very much reduced fine so yes about the reaction we have only sodium in the as a reagent so here there is no much of a thinking to be given as to what which reagent will initiate the reaction sodium will initiate the reaction nothing else can happen rx is not a acid it's not a base it's not a reactive metal this thing is quite stable so sodium is going to 
to initiate the reaction. So, so what sodium can does? Sodium does nothing but ionizes. It ionizes and loses electron. Now sodium is like going to produce hell lot of electron in the system like an electron machine gun. So electrons will be produced and the density of electron and the charge density will start to increase. Right? This is one thing that we can cite and understand. Now what next? Sodium is producing electrons like nothing. Now electron cannot go on increasing the system like that. Someone has to accept that electron because electron as such free like this is not stable. It has to go into the some orbital or anti-orbital. So what can happen? We don't have anything else. Rx is there now. Somehow Rx have to accommodate that electron. How is Rx going to accommodate that electron? Now when we studied SN2 reaction, I told you and once again I'll remind you about anti-bonding orbital. Now this is bonding orbital. This is anti-bonding orbital. Generally anti-bonding orbital would be empty in normal circumstances. Now this electron have to go somewhere. Bonding orbital is filled, right? Both for X and R. So either it will go in anti-bonding anti of R or it will go in anti-bonding of X, right? Let's first consider it goes into the anti-bonding of R. It has to go. It can't be there in the system. So there is no question of why. That electron has to go in some orbital and the orbitals are not available because they are already containing electron. So anti-bonding orbital of this R group is empty. So that electron will come and enter in this anti-bonding like a wave. Right? Consider it as a very fine particle of sand and we are pouring a little little bit slowly and gradually. Now what will happen if you remember the theory of mo molecular orbital theory and I, as I have told you while teaching you SN2 mechanism. Whenever the electronic density in anti-bonding starts to increase, the capacity of anti-bonding and bonding together is of holding two electron. The bonding orbital of R is holding the two electron of the sigma bond. Right? The two electron in the sigma bond is in both the orbital, that of R and that of X. So to say, we say that in the bonding orbital of this R or the carbon atom of this R, there are two electrons and those two electrons are also in the bonding orbital of X. So if, if we have to answer the question how many electrons are there in the bonding orbital of carbon atom in this R, we will say two. So the capacity is at the maximum level that it can be. So if electron is coming from an outer source then electronic capacity is increasing. Now that cannot increase. The electron has to be evacuated from the other end if it is increasing at one end. So the only thing that can happen here is because the system in the system electronic density is increasing so the outside there is a huge electronic pressure now from outside there is a pressure for the electron to enter into the bonding anti-bonding orbital you cannot stop that. So what can happen is you can empty up your bonding orbital and put that electron into the orbital of X. Now gradually electrons from outside will start to come in and in and from the front end you will put the electron out and out. When you do that, when you do that suppose one electron comes into the anti-bonding of R and R gives one electron from the bonding orbital to X. Now X will have its one own electron and the other electron of R will also come into the orbital of X. So X will have one exterior electron from outside. So a negative charge will come on X. And what will happen to R? Now think like this, if a negative charge comes on X, then the positive charge will come on R by the conservation of charge. And if a plus charge, R plus charge carrying R gains an electron from outside, it will come in a form of R dot. 